Welcome to Boundary End, an archaeological research center for writers, artists studying ancient America. Located in the Blue Ridge Mountains near Asheville, North Carolina, Boundary End was created by George Stewart after a career as an archaeologist and associate editor of National Geographic. His son David and daughter Anne continue this tradition by hosting groups from throughout the world for scholarly retreats and conferences. David Stewart is the David and Linda Sheely Professor of Mesoamerican Art and Writing at the University of Texas at Austin. Well, good afternoon or good evening, depending on where you're joining us from. Um, welcome to this next installment of the Boundary and Archaeology Research Center virtual lecture series. Um, it's so wonderful to, to be back with you. I know it's been a, a, a brief hiatus, um, but we're excited to be back again. Um, with another uh, online lecture series offering with, for you tonight. Um, I wanna also um, say thank you to everyone who has sponsored a Boundary End with a personal donation over the past year or two. Um, that has really helped us, this, this nonprofit organization um, runs um, with the support that you provide through your individual donations of any size through boundaryend.com. Um, and we're really grateful for that. Um, and um, we also wanted to say thank you to the North Carolina um, Humanities Council for their support over the past year um, with a uh, COVID-19 relief grant that has helped us to keep our programs um, happening, um, get more in-person events organized and up and running for the next year um, and maintain the Special Collections Library and Archive making these things and, and the publications more accessible to all of our audiences. Um, so once again, thank you all um, for your support. Um, I'm Dylan Clark, by the way. I'm sorry to introduce myself. I'm Dylan. Um, I am on the Boundary in Archaeology Research Center Board of Directors, um, and I'm coming at you today from Asheville, North Carolina, um, at the Office of State Archaeology, um, where I'm located. Um, and tonight, we're very uh, happy to welcome back our very own Dr. David Stewart, um, who is one of our fearless leaders at Boundary Inn, um, who's joining us today from Austin. But we're also uh, thrilled that he'll be uh, making his way back to his second home here in Western North Carolina very soon um, as a non-residential scholar at Boundary Inn um, for the next couple semesters um, as he's on sabbatical um, from the University of Texas at Austin. Um, as you know, uh, Dr. Stewart, is the Sheely Professor of Mesoamerican Art and Writing um, at, in the Department of Art and Art History at um, UT Austin. Um, and his work has spanned um, many years and across many of the subcultural regions of Mesoamerica, um, but his many contributions to Maya archeology span and epigraphy um, cannot be overstated. Um, but tonight, he's going to talk a little bit more about um, the Aztec calendar stone or the sunstone, um, which, uh, as many of you know, is a really iconic and important um, monument from Mesoamerica um, that is, has really um, taken on symbolic significance over the past couple of centuries um, as a uh, symbol of um, the indigenous cultures of Mexico. Um, so it's going to be really fascinating to hear more um, from Dr. Stewart um, about his, his reading of this monument. Um, this talk is also related to his most recent publication, um, King and Cosmos, an interpretation of the Aztec calendar stone. Um, and if you get a chance to check that out, it's a fantastic read, I, I highly recommend it. Um, so I wanna hand it over to Dr. Stewart. Um, once again, welcome everyone. Um, and without further ado, um, this talk is entitled Time, Space, and History on the Aztec Sunstone. Thank you, Dylan. I really appreciate that uh, introduction. Uh, welcome, everyone. Hello, everyone, uh, wherever you may be uh, this evening for uh, this presentation. Um, uh, it's been a little while since I've given a talk for the Boundary End series, but I'm really happy to be here, here with you all. And uh, I'm sure I'll do one uh, uh, fairly soon down the road. Um, I'm very excited with the new programs and, and things we have going at Boundary End and, and the Research Center tucked in a beautiful valley in Western North Carolina. Uh, and I look forward to being up there myself in a few days. Um, 
so my my talk this evening is uh, a little unusual for me. I think as Dylan was mentioning uh, in his introduction, um, I have spent most of my intellectual life and career studying the ancient Maya, and uh, especially with the decipherment of Maya hieroglyphs, um, uh, the study of Maya art and iconography and Maya archaeology. Uh, and this is a little different, and it's a little different in that um, I'm going to be focusing on one particular monument from a rather different culture in Mesoamerica, the Aztecs, uh, late post-classic period, Tenochtitlan, the Mexica, right? And uh, looking at, um, again, uh, aspects of their writing system, aspects of their iconography, as it is expressed in this very iconic monument. Um, as Dylan mentioned, I have a brand new book on this, uh, just published a, a few months ago called King and Cosmos, uh, a new interpretation of the Aztec calendar stone. Uh, this was published by uh, um, pre-Columbia Mesoweb Press, uh, and it's available on Amazon. Um, and it's, uh, it's not a very long book, uh, but I'm going to be hitting a few highlights of it here. This is the first time I've been able to talk about it uh, in uh, a context, you know, out in, out in the open, out in the public since it's been published. So I'm very uh, happy to be doing that with you all here. So I'm going to start sharing my slides um, and uh, get started here. Uh, there's a lot to cover, I have to say. Uh, this is a very complicated uh, and ornate sculpture. It's one that's very familiar to um, almost all of us. I, I imagine if you're tuning in tonight, uh, you generally know what the calendar stone looks like. Uh, let's face it, we can't really escape this image uh, in the uh, kind of pop culture iconography of Mesoamerica, right? It's it's all over um, uh, t-shirts and, you know, tchotchkes and the Cancun airport. It's all over pop culture and movies and TV shows, uh, tequila bottles, you name it. It's everywhere. It is a symbol, right? It's a symbol of uh, indigenous Mesoamerica. It's a symbol of Mexican identity, uh, even outside of the borders of Mexico, uh, especially here in the United States. It carries a lot of symbolic meaning. I'm not going to go into all of that, right? This is not really the purpose this evening to uh, talk about its, its many layered meanings in the modern world, although that's very important. And it's something that I think we should always keep in mind as we look at this monument and, and, and uh, look at the many ancient symbols and, and, and its iconography. Um, to see this connection between the past and the present, needless to say, is very, very uh, central to what we do as scholars. Uh, but what my purpose is this evening is to really look at its imagery as it was designed, as it was conceived in the very early years of the 16th century uh, in Tenochtitlan, the capital of the Mexica and the capital of the, uh, the empire uh, of the Triple Alliance. Um, now, there are many different names by which we know this monument. Uh, I've used the word calendar stone because it's rather familiar. It's a very old term. Uh, in Spanish, this, of course, would be the calendario azteca. Uh, it's also known widely as the sunstone. And so these are kind of interchangeable terms uh, in Spanish, piedra del sol, right? Um, the, the, the term calendar stone as common as it is, and as 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 much as I use it, and I I, I will use it almost out of habit here in in our, my presentation, um, it, it's not exactly a correct description of what it is. Right, um, it's not a calendar. It has calendrical elements in it. It has elements of um, ancient. Uh, Mesoamerican time and, and, and timekeeping in it, but it's not a calendar, right? This is a term, a descriptor for the monument that goes way back over two centuries, um, but it is not a calendar. 
Uh, one of the things that uh, uh, is kind of a pet peeve of mine, many, it may be for some of you out there as well, you know, if you ever Google something on the Maya calendar, you'll come up inevitably with images of the Aztec calendar stone. Uh, and, and it's not Maya, right? It comes from a particular uh, time, a particular place. Um, and, and needless to say, it's just become the symbol, right, of generic Mesoamerican kind of esoteric knowledge. Um, but uh, I, I, I think for that reason, right, there's so much baggage attached to it that we have to kind of strip it away. We have to revisit it from time to time. Uh, and what I want to try to do uh, in, in my presentation here is really talk about what it's about, what it was conceived as, where it was located, what it represents. There's plenty about it that I won't have time to get into this evening. So I'm just going to hit a few major themes and, and uh, uh, components of its iconography um, uh, this evening. Um, one could go on for a very long time about all of the detail that you see in this remarkable, beautiful uh, sculpture, one of the great artworks, I think, of, of ancient civilizations. Um, now, in terms of its uh, longstanding importance as a symbol, uh, I just want to mention before I get into the imagery and iconography that, you know, it emerged rather quickly. Uh, in the 19th century as a symbol of Mexican identity, right? Uh, uh, this goes way back. And I'm showing you here a photograph of uh, the Mexican uh, dictator, Porfirio Diaz, uh, around the turn of the last century, uh, posing in front of the calendar stone as it was displayed in the old uh, Museo Nacional, the National Museum in Mexico City. And there you see a little description of it there, the Calendario Azteca, Oh, Piedra del Sol, right? The Aztec calendar or the sunstone. Um, you know, it, it, there are many photographs like this of, of uh, 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 people of authority, uh, members of the Mexican government, presidents standing in front of this, right? Almost as if it was a, uh, a flag of the Mexican state. Um, it, it emerged as an important symbol after Mexican independence. Uh, it was first brought to light internationally around the time of Mexican independence in the early 19th century. So uh, it, it, it has this baggage that goes back uh, not only decades, but centuries in terms of its importance, 200 years. Uh, it was discovered over 230 years ago, right? So uh, there's been a long time for this to percolate uh, over time. But that that's another story, right? It's, it, it's importance as a symbol and as a uh, a symbol of identity is something that uh, we could talk a lot about. But again, I want to uh, maybe uh, move on to actual Aztec images and concepts. It's a large monument. Uh, we see it so often as a drawing or a photograph or as a tattoo or a graphic somewhere, right, that we maybe lose sight of what it is in terms of scale. But it is an amazingly large sculpture. It's it's one of the largest monuments we have from the uh, Aztec uh, world of late post-classic central Mexico. Uh, it's made of granite. It is, or I should say not granite, it's basalt. It's volcanic stone. Uh, and it is, it weighs over 20 tons. It, it's a, a very, very heavy monument. Here it is displayed in the new museum in Mexico City, right? The, the, well, relatively new. Uh, it's been there in the in the new Museum of uh, Anthropology uh, since it was installed there in the 1960s, right? So uh, here it is just showing you the scale of it again. Always displayed kind of upright, facing outward from a wall. I wanna talk tonight about its original setting. It was not meant to be seen this way when it was originally designed uh, by an Aztec artisan or team of artisans. It was rather meant to be seen flat uh, on the ground, horizontally facing upwards. Very important in understanding how it was uh, conceived as an artwork and as a monument. So what was it? What is this stone that we see all the time? Um, it's not a calendar, as I mentioned. 
So what is it, right? This is a fundamental question. And what I want to talk about in the first half of my talk tonight, more or less, are um, the indications we have of where it was, perhaps somewhat speculatively, and what it was in terms of its role and function as a physical object, as a physical monument. Um, now, it's important to talk about its history in order to talk about those particular topics. Yes, it's an important Mesoamerican monument, but we should remind ourselves it was not excavated by archeologists. Uh, archeology span as a discipline is a relatively new thing uh, in the world and in Mesoamerica. Um, it was found by accident. It was found in what is now downtown Mexico City uh, in 1790. So it's one of the very earliest um, of the great Aztec sculptures to come to light. This is the remarkable drawing that was made uh, right after its discovery uh, for the publication in 1792 by uh, Antonio Leon y Gama, a very important early historian and Aztec scholar who wrote the first description of the calendar stone. Um, it's a very accurate drawing that you see here, right? And this was uh, a, a rather uh, stunning thing at the time to see a uh, representation of an ancient Aztec sculpture um, published, right? Uh, uh, commented on, uh, described, interpreted in a scholarly intellectual way, right? This was uh, a very enlightened uh, uh, kind of period in, in the study or the consciousness of indigenous ancient Mexico, right? So rather than reburying monuments, although this sometimes did happen, uh, in the case of the Pedro del Sol and the Coatlicue monument, which was discovered around the same time, these were kept and made visible. And the Stone of Tisok is another example found uh, around, around the same time as well. Very important Aztec monuments. So uh, Alexander von Humboldt published this particular drawing uh, in his own publications, which really made the calendar stone uh, famous worldwide by uh, the early decades of the 19th century. This was also super important in terms of um, its uh, recognition as a symbol of Mexico, right? This early publication and dissemination of it. So Leone Gama is super important. He establishes many fundamental interpretations of it as a representation of the sun, uh, some of the calendrical elements that I'll talk about in a second, he recognized as early as 1790, right? Because he was this is a historian who was reading up on many aspects of Aztec religion and cosmology, uh, hints of those things that existed in the written literature of the time, right? Not everything was wiped out, right? There were histories of ancient Mexico that were uh, by Clavijero and others that were published. Uh, and he was able to understand some of these elements as soon as he saw it in 1790. Kind of remarkable, must have been an amazing time uh, for, for him. Um, now, where it was found uh, was in the great uh, main plaza of Mexico City. Uh, it was a couple of feet under the surface, and it was discovered in the process of the uh, cleaning and renovations of the Plaza Mayor uh, in that year of 1790. Um, a decision was made to renovate this space, which was basically a, a mud flat that had been a market for many years. Uh, a new viceroy was coming from Spain. This was before Mexican independence. And uh, the plaza was, was cleaned and renovated and paved. And as part of that work, they discovered the calendar stone more or less in this area. We are looking north, let's see. Yes, we're looking northwards towards the cathedral, which is still there today. This is the Palacio Nacional or the National Palace, which used to be the uh, the royal palace of, of Moctezuma, 
in, in before the conquest. Um, uh, and this is, of course, still there as well. And this is the plaza that today we know as the Socolo in downtown Mexico City. Uh, the calendar stone was discovered right about here um, in the, uh, the, the, the corner of the, the plaza, sort of the southeast corner, as you see it here. Um, you see the streets. Uh, and there was once a canal. Uh, you don't see it in this view, but a canal that ran just below where you see that street right there. Uh, so this was a, a central place, obviously, um, uh, it, it garnered a lot of attention at the time. And rather than reburying it, it was uh, after some discussion and I think some, some uh, debates back and forth, uh, it was decided to uh, place it in the wall of uh, the cathedral where it stayed for many, many decades uh, until it was moved to the old um, National Museum. So this is a an old postcard image you see of the cathedral, and there's the Piedra del Sol there, uh, where it was displayed uh, for everyone to see for many many years. Again, I, I can't emphasize enough how important this was as a change of attitude towards ancient uh, Mexican art, in terms of keeping it displayed, keeping it visible, rather than hiding it, rather than destroying it. Now, um, it didn't take long for the calendar stone and other important Aztec monuments to, again, uh, be part of this repertoire of visual elements, of, of icons that were recycled all the time in the depiction of ancient Mexico or this vision of ancient Mexico that developed in the 19th century. Uh, this is a very uh, dramatic painting by uh, uh, Count jean Frederick Valdeck, very famous for some of his Maya uh, uh, depictions of, of Palenque and other sites. Uh, here is his vision of the of Tenochtitlan and a plaza in Tenochtitlan uh, with the great Aztec temple. Uh, here is something more or less uh, based on the, the sacrificial stone of Tisok. Uh, a place of gladiatorial combat, as we'll talk about. And there, way in the background, you'll see is the calendar stone displayed uh, upright, um, facing out in, in a way it, it probably wasn't at all. Um, but here, this is kind of a, a just representing the way this vision of the Aztec world was, was rather strange and, and exoticized. Uh, early on in the 19th century. Of course, with archaeology and with an understanding of the physicality of the place, uh, this changed um, quite rapidly during the 20th century. Um, a very important early scholar uh, who studied the iconography of the Aztecs, if not the most important, who really began the field of ancient Mexican iconography and art history was Edward Saylor, uh, well over a hundred years ago, around the turn of the last century again, who um, really reacted against many of the fanciful and esoteric interpretations of the calendar stone. He was, he was pushing back against this idea that the Piedra del Sol was some mechanistic, vision of time, right? That it was some sort of uh, working sundial, which is what some early scholars were, were considering. Leoni Gama, uh, for example, when he first commented on the calendar stone in, in 1790, really put out this idea that it was maybe an, an active calendar, something like a sundial, something like a, a clock that would exist on a church bell tower where it ended up eventually, right? Well, Saylor was um, uh, reacting against many of these fanciful interpretations. This is a quotation that's important to understand, which is that the so-called Aztec calendar, quote unquote, is only an image of the sun, no more and no less, and an expression of the conception the Mexicans connected with the sun, right? So Saylor, remarkable scholar, a hero to all of us, was correct in 
trying to bring this amazing sculpture kind of back down to earth, so to speak, and see it as an image within the larger context of Mexican iconography, of Aztec iconography. And so he is expressing here how it's really just an image of the solar disk. It is the sun. There's no need to really talk about it as a calendar so much, right? So this is where the Piedra del Sol idea comes in, the sunstone, a more neutral term. Um, and it's uh, a term that we will always be using, right? And Sailor was correct. But one thing that I want to mention here in my talk is that it's not just the sun, right? Um, there is so much more to it. He says no more and no less. Well, there's more to it. Um, and, and the idea here is that the conceptions that he's talking about, that they connected with the sun, were very complex and very multi-layered. Um, and uh, this is what we're really going to get into uh, here in, in my talk. So Sailor was right, but I would also say that he was simplifying things a little too much for the sake of his own argument. Now, what was it? Um, there have been many suggestions about its function as a space, as an object. Um, and very early on, um, scholars recognized that it was part of a class of sculptures uh, that we find um, around Tenochtitlan. Um, some of them are, are rather large and imposing. Some of them are much smaller uh, that are called Kwashikali in the Nahuatl language, right? These are eagle vessels or eagle uh, containers that were used in sacrificial rituals. Um, they are not containers all the time. They're kind of, kind of figurative, metaphorical containers uh, where one would place uh, the heart of heart sacrifice, for example, right? This is what a kwashikali is. There are many different types of these. Uh, some are monumental in scale and others are much smaller, as I mentioned. Uh, and it's clear that the, uh, the sunstone, the calendar stone, is part of this um, wider category of sacrificial stones, right? Um, no doubt, like the stone of Tizoc that you see here, and this is a much smaller one, all at kind of relative uh, uh, scale, showing you the variety. Um, and... And um, this is something that uh, I absolutely agree with, and all scholars agree with, that it was an eagle vessel, a kwashikali. Um, this is a, a, a confirmation of this, right? These are uh, colonial representations, in this case from uh, uh, Duran's uh, Historia General de Nueva España, uh, showing uh, a sacrificial uh, scene on top of one of these sun stones, one of these large disks uh, with a solar uh, design, and the victim is splayed out right on top of it. Um, there's no question that many uh, stones such as this were used for this, right? Kwashikalis, um, the Pedra del Sol, the calendar stone may well be a, a large example of this. Another category which has been brought into the mix here is a, another kind of solar representation or solar stone called a temalakat or a stone spindle, as you see here. Uh, this is a representation of a warrior, again, a sacrificial victim who has been tied on to a temalakat that is on a platform, a circular stone on a platform. And uh, there is a mock combat uh, between the victim and a warrior here, a jaguar warrior, um, uh, who eventually slays him and he is sacrificed. Uh, so you'll find these terms in the literature, Kwashikali, Temalakat, uh, as names for these kinds of disc-shaped stones. Um, there's every reason to believe that these are not exclusive categories, right? That these are, are, are maybe two just different descriptors for the same general wide class of monument um, uh, uh, or of sculpture, right? Uh, 
some of which were actually stood upon and used as stages for sacrifice, right? So I don't want anyone to think that these are exclusive categories. The, the sunstone was a kashikali in that it was probably used for uh, heart sacrifices. It was also probably a temelakak, a, a, a wheel, a stone spindle that turns, right? Metaphorically, as we'll get to in a second, uh, that was used for these gladiatorial uh, uh, performances, you might say, right? Both of them being sacrificial uh, kinds of events. Okay, uh, let's get down to, again, the, the physical place of where it was. This is the modern view of the Sokolo, of the old Plaza Mayor, of the old plaza of Tenochtitlan. Uh, not many people realize that uh, the Sokolo is actually a vestige of the ancient urban landscape of Tenochtitlan. Um, this was not clear to me when I first went to Mexico City, that's for sure. Um, but it was really remarkable to see and learn over the years that this big open space that you see uh, in, in, uh, in Mexico, in, in Ciudad de Mexico, uh, with the cathedral, with the National Palace here, is an ancient plaza. Uh, you'll notice back here, it's a little hard to see, but those green squares you see are the uh, roofs on the Templo Mayor. This is the archaeological uh, site that uh, is the, the foundations and the, the remains of the great temple of Tenochtitlan. Um, and uh, the sacred precinct that was the enclosure for the great temple uh, basically was uh, to the north of the plaza you see today. Uh, this street that runs right into the plaza to the south is actually uh, exactly where the ancient causeway was that came in from the south. Uh, other large avenues and streets around the center of Mexico City, of course, are part of that pre-Columbian landscape, but pre-conquest uh, landscape as well, an urban design. This is a wonderful image here uh, of the plaza as it existed in the colonial era um, around uh, 1695. This is the, the, the great plaza. It was called the Plaza de Armas for a while. Again, you see the cathedral, you see the national palace. And in 1695, right, this is just a, 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 under a century before the discovery of the uh, uh, calendar stone, when this painting was made, the calendar stone was still buried under the, the plaza, right about here. Little did those people know who were walking around uh, that there was a, a major Aztec sculpture right there. Um, notice the market. Notice how uh, dense it was. You don't see it today as a market, of course, but uh, in the colonial era, it was. Um, this is a canal that you see in this painting. Uh, again, a vestige of the uh, old uh, communication routes and the old kind of urban layout of Tenochtitlan, uh, a canal that was instrumental for the bringing of goods in uh, from around the communities, the surrounding areas into the market. So uh, th this is not the only market in Mexico City, but not many people realize that the Socolo was the site for uh, one of the largest markets of, of the uh, entire valley. Um, and this is a pre-Columbian function of the space as well, where the calendar stone was discovered. Um, the uh, kind of continuity of space uh, between uh, the pre-conquest Tenochtitlan and the colonial period is really brought home by this uh, important map that many of you will recognize. Um, this is the so-called Nuremberg map uh, printed in uh, what's now Germany in uh, 1524, I believe, uh, very soon after the um, conquest, printed to go along with uh, one of the letters of Cortez that was printed and circulated right uh, in Europe at the time. Uh, and here we see Lake Tashkoko. Uh, here we see the island of Tenochtitlan. Uh, it's a very Europeanized map, but also one that uh, 
is, is widely thought to be uh, incorporating a lot of pre-Columbian indigenous elements as well. I think this kind of circular design, this centered uh, island and so forth, some of these may be indigenous uh, uh, modes of representation of space. So this is kind of a hybrid representation that may have been uh, copied by uh, Cortez and his artisans. Um, what I wanted to point out here is that we have the sacred precinct of Tenochtitlan, as many of you know. And just a little detail if we zoom in, uh, here is the canal that we were just looking at a second ago, right? Right here uh, on the south side of the plaza. And here is the plaza itself. It says Platea, right, in Latin. Uh, here is plaza, canal, and the sacred precinct with the temples. Uh, just to the east, I know it's it's down below, but this is the eastern direction, um, is the, uh, it says here, domus, I think, my Latin's not great, but it's the, the, the house of Moctezuma, right? Uh, and this is the uh, uh, rather simplified view of Moctezuma's palace that was on the eastern side of the plaza, right? So this is the national palace exactly the same layout. Here is a modern map, of course, that shows the layout in terms of the archaeology. Uh, I just wanted to show you this precinct with the four roads coming in, uh, the center, the navel of the Aztec cosmos, uh, architecturally and religiously, but also down below here in the pre-Columbian world, that Sokolo is the great plaza or the market. And here is the Palace of Montezuma, just to make sure that we're oriented correctly uh, in, in the ancient or pre Columbian landscape of uh, Tenochtitlan. The Palace of Montezuma must have been a very imposing place. Uh, this is a, a vivid and, and wonderful uh, painting by Scott Gentling. Uh, of what Montezuma's palace might have looked like. We don't have a lot of direct physical evidence for it, but uh, these may well be the dimensions of the original compound uh, walled here to the south of the uh, central precinct. And here, uh, facing on the front of the palace of Montezuma is the plaza, what is today the Sokolo and what had been great market uh, in the colonial period and what, what had been a market in the um, pre-conquest period as well. Now, here we get into the calendar stone. Why am I talking about all of this? Well, this is where I think as a possibility, and I'm just putting it out there as a, a, a possibility now, because there's a lot of debate about this. The, the, the find spot of the calendar stone may well have been more or less where it was found. Uh, or Well, <laughs> now, let me put this another way. The find spot is where it was found. I mean, the original setting for it may well have been its find spot. Um, the original placement of it may have been not far from where it was discovered in 1790. Um, and uh, there's some circumstantial evidence for this. Um, Diego Duran, the, the famous historian uh, and commenter on uh, Aztec religion and history in the 16th century, mentions um, that there were two fixed stones placed on platforms uh, with small stairways of four steps each. On one was painted the image of the sun, on the others the count of the years, months, and days. This is sounding familiar, right? Uh, one of the stones which I've mentioned stood where sacrifices were begun and the other where the sacrifice ended. So kind of a curious statement there. But this is the important one. Many of us today have some knowledge regarding them. And one of the stones was in the main square of the city for a long time. It stood next to the canal where today an open air market is held in front of the royal mansion. That's exactly the Sokolo that I described. Uh, um, now, what's important here is uh, that we have right in the 
area where the calendar stone was discovered, an attestation of this a stone rather like it existing in that place. On top of that, uh, we have this really intriguing reference. Uh, a large number of Negroes formerly gathered continually to sport and commit atrocities, right? Uh, these would be uh, slaves or escaped slaves, or it's hard to say, uh, of Mexico City um, who were gathering around the stone, almost as if perhaps it was a symbol of resistance <laughs> uh, to Spanish authority. Uh, that's a whole other topic of discussion that that is just fascinating to me. But I wanna focus in on this very last statement. This is why uh, the most illustrious blah, 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 uh, uh, Viceroy, right? And an Archbishop of Mexico had it buried in view of the crimes and homicides committed there. So a historical reference to a placement of a sunstone in the plaza and of its intentional burying. Uh, by the Archbishop. Um, many uh, have commented on this, and, and I don't think it's uh, hard to uh, uh, really deny that this must be a reference to the calendar stone that we know so well. Now, markets and plazas. Um, these are very important spaces in ancient Mesoamerica, as we all know, and in the colonial period, and even today. Uh, the Nahuatl word for a market or a plaza is tianquistli. It's a word that may be familiar to some of you who speak Spanish around uh, Mexico City today. The tianguis, right, is a market, uh, a supermarket. It's called a tianguis. This is a Nahuatl word. Um, this is the representation, very figurative representation of the tianquistli uh, or Etian Kisli in, uh, in Mexico City or around Mexico. It, you see the activities, uh, people buying and selling uh, commodities. You see slaves who are shown here uh, also to be bought and sold. Uh, and this is uh, shown rather curiously in a circular design because this is uh, a very playful representation of a market. They're not circular in plan. Rather, this circular element is a hieroglyph. This is, as I will show you in a second, the uh, Nahuatl hieroglyph for the word tianquistli for market. There are many examples of this. So the artisan here, this indigenous artisan, has taken the hieroglyph for the market and shown people inside of it. The circular design is important. And this is something that uh, kind of uh, presages where I'll go with the with the calendar stone. Here are some examples of the market glyph, the Tianquistli glyph. Uh, this is from the Codex Mendoza, uh, showing uh, here just the hieroglyph with its label, right? Lugar de, de Mercado, it says, right? The place of the market, right? And um, we have many examples of this in different manuscripts and place names. Uh, for example, uh, and in other contexts. Now, there was a really, for me personally, a, a very inspiring uh, article and, and study that was done in 2010 uh, by uh, my colleague Leonardo Lopez Lujan, uh, excuse me, uh, there, and uh, his colleague, uh, uh, Bertina Olmedo. It was published in Arqueología Mexicana, the, the magazine, where they talked a lot about the importance of the Tianquistli hieroglyph, the market hieroglyph, in its connection with certain stone sculptures, um, one of which is now in the National Museum in Mexico City that you see here. Um, they pointed out that uh, this disc, the stone disc, is basically a hieroglyphic form, right? That it's basically a representation of the market hieroglyph, the same one that we see in the Mendoza Codex uh, and that we see in a few other contexts. Now, there, there's a range of style here, right? So it may not look exactly the same, uh, but you see the little radiating lines, you see the circles uh, and, and some geometric elements on the interior. 
Uh, these are all things that are pretty common in these Tianqisli signs. Now, they talk about these altars that are three-dimensional hieroglyphs, essentially, as being another category, another type of monument called a momostli. I know I'm throwing a lot of terms out here, but bear with me. Uh, a momostli is essentially an altar, a platform with an altar that's open air. It's out in the markets. It, it's at crossroads. It, it, it's a place where people routinely on kind of a daily basis uh, leave offerings, uh, burn incense, um, uh, engage with the forces of the cosmos. Um, and it's translated here as an altar, a chapel, uh, an oratory uh, around crossroads, right? And Duran, again, our, our source for so much, uh, mentions what these were used for. He says, there was in the old days, this is him writing as an older man now, um, a god of the markets and festivals, right? So this is the pre-Columbian past, whom they called or whom they placed on a momostly, which are shrines in the manner of peaks, or, or, or I think here they're talking about raised platforms that they used in ancient times. And since then, as boys, we called them laying places, places of idle gossip. There were many of them along the roads and at the crossroads and in the market. On those in the market, there were fastened carved stones as big as a shield and on them sculpted a round figure like the face of the sun with some paintings like flowers around it with round circles. Well, this is what uh, Leonardo and Bettina were talking about in their article, which is that um, these market glyphs on stones, on discs, are probably examples of these markers for markets that Duran is describing right? Uh, it makes perfect sense that this would be a market stone with a market label on it. So this was really uh, kind of an intriguing example to me of a, a physical object that is a hieroglyph, right? Uh, something we know also from Maya art. Uh, again, there are many examples probably of these we can look at uh, that start to look a lot like the sunstones uh, uh, that we were just talking about, right? So uh, this is uh, something that looks a bit like a, a, a momostly. It looks like uh, one of these um, uh, representations of the market glyph with the radiating lines. You see the geometric forms on the interior, right? So uh, a vague resemblance here. Uh, what I want to uh, uh, emphasize is that, again, I think there is a broad uh, overlap between these categories that we have talk, talked about already. You know, the eagle vessels, the stone spindles, uh, momostlis, all of these are essentially uh, altars or surfaces uh, for performance and for ritual. Uh, and uh, some of them are associated with markets and other ones aren't necessarily associated with markets and plazas. But uh, I think there's an important crossover between them. Um, the idea of a plaza altar, it should be familiar to many of you for uh, from many sites in Mesoamerica. Uh, Teotihuacan, of course, here has some much older examples. Uh, here are the uh, uh, platforms with the four staircases. Um, and uh, a kind of a centered area as well. Um, this is exactly what Duran was describing uh, for the sunstone in Tenochtitlan is existing on a, a raised platform. Um, and uh, to bring this home, right, into a very, very kind of tight circle, I think, uh, is again uh, a representation here of a uh, sacrificial victim. Um, this is uh, a painting from Duran's uh, 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 history and also from his uh, comments on the calendar and the gods, uh, where he shows the uh, sacrificial victim here um, at the festival associated with um, the, 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 stun, the sun at Zenith. 
and the the victim is shown here with his kind of mock armaments but look where he's standing he's standing on one of these four-sided platforms and the circular stone even has uh very familiar elements uh that we recognize from the calendar stone right uh lo look at how the sun is right above him as well with that hieroglyphic symbol which we will talk about in a second right there's kind of a mirroring between uh what's above and what is below uh, the captive notice here again that the circular element that is the um stone on which he's perched which he's standing is essentially the tianquistli hieroglyph um, these are other examples of the market sign or the market glyph from other manuscripts the the chronica de wishotzingo and others as well and, and uh, this one in particular is almost a dead ringer uh for the uh kind of segmented circle that we see right here right now what i'd like to uh suggest and this is pure speculation uh is that the 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 sunstone the calendar stone that um we're all familiar with not only was it flat and 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 facing upwards which has been acknowledged for many years in fact it was uh, Alfredo Chavero the in the 1870s who first suggested this but I'd like to suggest that it was um on one of these platforms much like you see depicted in Duran or much like you see de in in walking around Mesoamerican sites right and that it may well have been out in a plaza rather than being associated let's say with one of the uh, uh you know interior spaces of a temple in Tenochtitlan in the sacred precinct it may well have been more out in the open if we take Duran's word uh and 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 make those linkages assuming those are true and again maybe um some of those assumptions are are uh, not always viable but I think there's a really interesting circumstantial case to be made that this is more or less what we're looking at and also to reiterate that a momostly that a kwashikali a temalakat all of these descriptors we use for altars um are are overlapping in their functions and in their categories right a momostly is really i think the more i think generic term for one of these altars it's out in the open right now, the word momostly, let me just go back here and show you, go back a couple of slides. The word momostly for altar has a really interesting etymology. It means a daily place. It is derived from a noun in Nahuatl, mostla, which means tomorrow or the next day the reduplication of the the syllable on the front of that makes a new noun uh momostly and this is where you get this idea of recurrence of repetition right a daily place day after day after day momostly um they are literally places associated with just the passing of days and the passing of time uh they're everyday kinds of ritual spaces that's what a momostly is in markets in crossroads now when i was thinking about this uh, a number of years ago i was like well wait a minute that sounds kind of familiar to me and i, I immediately thought of the the name of the town in in guatemala uh familiar to some of you no doubt momostenango right uh, that's a nahuatl place name uh momos Tenanko, right? The at the citadel or at the wall of the altars is literally what that means. Momos Tenango is very famous in the world of Maya studies and in in the study of of Maya religion uh, for its altars. Uh, uh, the the classic ethnography by by Barbara Tedlock. Uh, time in the Highland Maya is focused on the town of Momostongo. Uh, it's a place of ritual, right? And here you see today uh, the principal town altar or Momostli 
of Momus Tenango, right? It's an incredible example of continuity uh, from the colonial period and the pre-Columbian period up to today. These are not called Momostlis by the uh, inhabitants, the citizens of Momus Tenango today, but this is why it had this name uh, why it was named this in the late post-classic period and in the colonial period. What is amazing to me is that in the plaza and market of Momos Tenango, Guatemala today, there is an altar. It is a rectangular, centrally placed altar in front of the church uh, where uh, there is ceremonial burning, but also, of course, everyday stuff that happens here. You know, it almost gets buried literally in the goods of the market. But its origin is as exactly what we've been talking about, one of these momoslis. Now, I'm going to start going a little bit into things that may not seem relevant at first. But what this kind of opens up now is a wider Mesoamerican context. And this is, I think, very important. One of the... Uh, places I'm coming from in this kind of new take on the calendar stone is that it's not an isolated thing. It's not just a Kwashikali, not just an Aztec or a Mexica kind of monument or, or a Temalakat or a Momosli for that matter, but rather it's part of a much broader tradition in Mesoamerica, a very old tradition of altars and of circular stones that were used for ritual purposes and which were used for the marking of time. Um, what immediately comes to mind are the innumerable discs and disc-shaped stones that one finds at Maya sites. Um, altars um, in front of stele, for example, or very often on their own, out in plazas, uh, and very often carved with hieroglyphs, right? They can be carved with, in this case, from the site of Tonina, uh, an 11 Ahau date, which is marking a, a katun or a, 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 another kind of period ending uh, in the calendar, uh, a, a calendar stone in its own right, right? Uh, I really do think that these are related. I really do think that the design of the Piedra del Sol in uh, the very early 16th century was tapping into very, very old, old ideas about um, uh, the formal qualities of sacred stones and sacred altars that symbolize time and that symbolize cosmology, right? For the classic Maya, right, there, there are many examples of these. Many of them are called uh, sibiktun, uh, which means something like soot stone. Uh, because there were places of burning, uh, just like a momosli, just like we were seeing in Momos Tenango. Um, and, and here are some drawings of, of some Maya examples of these, all from Tonina, again with uh, uh, circular designs, uh, uh, texts, but emblazoned with large hieroglyphs in their center uh, that are markers of time periods. Um, this is, I really think, the kind of deep intellectual roots of what we're looking at in the calendar stone for the Aztecs. The calendar stone is not Maya. I'm not saying it's Maya. It's its its own design. But the Aztecs were well aware, I think, of uh, other Mesoamerican traditions and cultures, even going back centuries into the classic period. Now, we find just as with the uh, sculptures of Tenochtitlan, uh, at Maya sites, a wide variety of these disc, disc stones. Uh, some of them are small, some of them are medium, some of them are quite large, usually made of limestone, right? So they're, uh, they were maybe limited in terms of the sizes of these things that they could carve. But here's a nice example of one from Yaschilan in, in Chiapas. Uh, uh, these are all over Yaschilan and at a few other sites as well. I just wanted to show a few of them here. Um, out in plazas, out in uh, patios, uh, in front of temples. Um, they are carved, many of them, not all of them, but many of them, uh, with hieroglyphic texts. Uh, this one in particular at Yaschilan looks terrible. Um, you may be wondering why I'm showing you such an eroded 
uh, uh, sculpture. But what's intriguing here is that you see these figures who are holding up um, uh, this band of hieroglyphs, right? There are four of them, four of these crouching figures. Uh, these are recognizable as the the uh, pavatuns, as they're sometimes called, right? The 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 gods of the four directions who hold up the sky, right? This is just a giveaway that uh, many of these disc-shaped stones are cosmological in nature, right? They are microcosms. They're representations of cosmic space. Uh, as eroded as this is, we can still recognize that. Um, I think the stones are often represented at Yashchilan as being, uh, you know, uh, uh, kind of members or, or participants in, in rituals. Um, in this case, the ruler uh, bird jaguar is shown casting his, his uh, sacred essence upon one of these bound stones. Uh, right, so they're they're interacted with directly in these rituals. Um, here are just some others from Yashchilan that I thought I would show you that have more complicated imagery on them as well. They are always used for the marking and commemoration, and for symbolizing time. They're always used for the marking of a period ending in the calendar of the Maya, or for an an anniversary uh, of some important date. Right, and then you have them directly interacted with um, by, by the ruler and his attendant here. Um, you see this kind of interaction even on uh, a combination such as this. This is Tikal, right? But again, it's the same kind of scene. Uh, a disc altar with uh, symmetrical design, uh, captives in this case, uh, cosmological in its layout, and then the ruler who is interacting directly with the altar, right? So the stela might catch our attention here. That's the portrait of the king, but he is actually here interacting with the disc altar itself. He's casting his uh, incense or his uh, kind of maze or blood or however you want to interpret it onto these stones in order to bless them. We even find uh, more direct representations of bound captives with ropes on these disc altars at Teak Hall. Why am I showing you these? Well, this is highly reminiscent of those gladiatorial scenes that we saw uh, with the uh, Temelakat stones uh, among the Aztecs. Not exactly the same, but here you see this association of captive display um, um, uh, lying on them, uh, much like you would have seen a, a, a captive about to be sacrificed in a much later Aztec ceremony. Again, I think these have a long history in Mesoamerica, and many of them do, in fact, tap into Maya precedents. Now, the, the, the final kind of section here, and, and I, I won't take quite as long uh, getting into this, because I know I've been uh, talking uh, far too long already, uh, is to uh, talk about the imagery, uh, at least a couple of important aspects of the imagery, because um, there's a lot to talk about here. It is the sun. We all recognize, I think, the solar aspect of this with the radiating points. But there's a lot of iconography, right? There are these concentric bands, uh, segmented elements. There are serpents that come down uh, on either side that are the, uh, the fire serpents, I think, representing heat uh, the, the, and the light of the sun coming down. Um, I'm mainly going to focus here on the, the central element, uh, the face and the hieroglyphs around it. Um, my argument is that the entire thing is basically a hieroglyphic composition um, that must be understood in terms of Nahuatl writing and uh, the words uh, associated with these signs, some of the words we've already been talking about. Uh, this is the drawing that I recently did of the uh, stone of the main elements of it uh, for the book. Uh, so a lot of those elements pop out again. Um, I want to point out to you that they, we have these radiating lines also uh, coming off 
uh, near the fire serpent. And we have these segmented elements that look a lot like some things we've already been seeing. I'll come back to that. The, uh, the, the most spare, most basic representation of the sun for the Aztecs is uh, this hieroglyph, Tonatiu. Um, this is the word for the sun. Uh, Tonatiu is, is a, a, actually a noun that means, it's very descriptive actually, it means uh, uh, he that goes along or moves along becoming warm, Tonatiu, right? So uh, the, that which rises in the sky and gets hot uh, over the course of time. Uh, we see the radiating elements. There are also some jade beads that are very elemental to the design of the Tonatiu hieroglyph. Again, probably representing light and shininess. Uh, but this, this has its own long history in Mesoamerican art that I won't have time to get into. Um, in the center, as many know, is another hieroglyph. And this is the representation of the calendrical period that it's marking, that it is labeling on the sun. Uh, this is the symbol we see here in a simple example uh, of four olin or nahui olin, four movement. Uh, this is the uh, name here on this particular solar disk. Um, uh, essentially the same thing, but much simpler. Um, and, and it is labeling here the sun as having this particular name. I think you can see the connection here, right, with that simpler Tonatiu hieroglyph here, a more elaborated, but with this added hieroglyphic label. What is for movement? Well, uh, this should be familiar to many of you, of course, because in uh, the uh, creation narratives of, of the Aztecs, uh, we have the myth or the legend of the five sons, right? The Leyendo de los Soles. And the most recent iteration of the sun in that system was called for movement. Uh, and, and this is a, a simple example of the uh, number four with the Olin day sign, the number four Olin day sign. And here is the number four and the Olin day sign. Don't read that as a number, by the way. It's not five Olin. That's four. That is just the little bead that goes on this little descending element of the Olin uh, sign itself, right? So we've all known this. And in fact, uh, Leoni Gama recognized this back in 1790, uh, that this was uh, the, the symbol for the current sun. Um, the legend of the suns, the Leyendo de los Soles, I won't go into the detail of it here. It's well known. It's well published. Uh, uh, you can study this, uh, but there were uh, five suns, right? We are in the fifth or in the Aztec period, it was the fifth sun. And there were four that preceded, uh, four jaguar, four wind, four rain, and four water. All names based on uh, the 260 day calendar, um, names for different suns that came and went in previous creations. So the, the Nahui Olin or four movement, of course, is the fifth uh, and last known of all of these. Nicely summarized in this hieroglyphic composition uh, in this altar stone at the uh, Art Institute of Chicago, where we see a beautiful example, much simplified of, of four movement. And here are the earlier time periods, right? Four Jaguar for wind, for uh, rain, and for water, right? Arranged in this, culminating in this centered uh, expression of time. Same idea as we see on the calendar stone, right? Because, and let me get to a photograph of it. I think I have one, or at least a, uh, an image that kind of pops it all out. Here is uh, for Jaguar, for wind, for rain and for water. And these are uh, reduced in scale and embedded in the, uh, the wings, quote unquote, or arms of the larger Olin symbol, right? 
and here you have four movement. This, of course, has a cosmological aspect of it as a design, right, with the center and the four quarters. Um, but um, that's something that you may or may not be obvious, right? The symmetry is all important in, in a lot of these designs that uh, we see throughout Mesoamerica. Now, something that is important to realize here is that embedded within the composition of the calendar stone, uh, and this is not new, right? This was pointed out by Richard Townsend and, and I think others as well, is that there is a counterclockwise kind of arrangement to all of these elements. If you look at the central portion, here's jaguar, wind, rain, water, right? Counterclockwise in kind of temporal order. And also the uh, first concentric band uh, on, right outside the uh, Olin symbol uh, has all of the 20 day signs, but they're also arranged counterclockwise. Right here is Sipatli for alligator, wind, house, lizard, snake, sky, all the way around, all 20 of them. Here's Olin, right, the 17th, and then it ends in flower, right? So these are again arranged uh, counterclockwise. Now, this is intentional, right? Uh, this, this motion is encoded in the design. And um, I'm sure that uh, the Olin symbol, it, with Olin meaning motion, right, is related to that element, right? Um, it, it is a moving image in a sense because uh, it's all about uh, the sun and its motion across the sky and its motion across time. All of that is beautifully, uh, uh, I think, uh, embedded within all of these elements that you see here. Um, so counterclockwise. Um, as the physical object, I think we have to understand that the calendar stone may well have been engaged with, it may have been approached, it may have been walked around uh, in a similar fashion as a ritual space, as a stage, you might say, as a momostly, as a daily place, right? Um, as Townsend pointed out, uh, and, and others have, have commented on, right? Um, Rituals uh, and processions uh, almost always tend to replicate this counterclockwise movement because it is cosmic movement, right? It is the natural order of things uh, for um, uh, uh, processions to replicate the movement of the sun. If this sounds a bit improbable or, or uh, as if it's just an assumption, I do want to point out that there's excellent ethnographic uh, backing for this um, from throughout Mesoamerica. The sun is seen to move in a counterclockwise fashion if it's kind of flattened on a two-dimensional plane. Um, one of the most wonderful illustrations of this uh, comes from the work of Gary Gossen uh, and his description of Tzotzil Maya cosmology and ritual uh, in the town of Chamula in Chiapas. Um, it, it's also been documented in Oaxaca. It's been documented throughout Mesoamerica, uh, counterclockwise movement. Um, that exists seasonally. It exists in terms of uh, the, the daily path of the sun as well. And it's replicated in terms of circuits around the main plaza uh, of Chamula. Right, and, and this is the chart that uh, I don't have time to go, go into here, but you can see that um, you, this motion is sort of uh, encoded everywhere uh, in terms of, of movement in ritual space. Uh, Gossen describes it beautifully here. Um, the fundamental orientation to the right clarifies Chamula ritual treatment of space. Religious cargo holders themselves possess an aspect of deity that they share with the sun and the saints. That's something to come back to. Um, while acquiring for themselves a sacred aspect through exemplary behavior and language, they metaphorically follow the sun's pattern of motion by moving to their own right, 
through any ritual space in front of them. Thus, there is an overwhelming tendency of almost all Chamula ritual motion to follow a counterclockwise pattern. The direction is the horizontal equivalent of the sun's daily vertical path across the heavens from east to west. Um, ritual circuits proceed counterclockwise because that direction is the logical horizontal equivalent of the annual solar cycle and the daily solar cycle. What a wonderful uh, kind of summary statement about um, this aspect we see of uh, late post-classic Aztec Mexica ritual as well, and also what's embedded in the design of the calendar stone. It is the sun, but it's also a moving image uh, that incorporates exactly what he was describing uh, for Chamula. And this comes back around to uh, this idea that this altar was a daily place, right? It's, it's day after day after day. Um, that movement, the olin of the image, uh, the counterclockwise motion that's embedded in it, in it is, I think, a direct reference to its function as one of these altars. Uh, as one of these platforms, uh, day after day after day. Those are all shown directly in the sunstone itself. Lastly, in the last few minutes here, I want to mention something about who it is. There have been many interpretations about the central face. It's the sun god, clearly, right? It must be if it's the center of the sun disk, Tonatiu himself. This was Edward Saylor's interpretation, uh, Herman Beyer, H.B. Uh, Nicholson, a very famous uh, Aztec scholar who passed away uh, not too long ago. Um, others have had other suggestions, right? Tlalteuctli, the Earth Lord. This was a suggestion by Doris Haydn and Carlos Navarrete and Richard Townsend. Uh, this is suggested by the, uh, the, the knife tongue that emerges from uh, the face and also the kind of clawed uh, talons that you see on either side of him. These are, are characteristics one sees of many of the earth lords in Aztec iconography. And also the fact that it was flat and facing upwards from the earth um, really did, I think, support that particular argument that uh, it could be the face of the earth uh, combined with aspects of the sun. Uh, Cecilia Klein, in a really uh, nuanced study, suggested that uh, it could actually be a more, um, more related to the sun, but kind of the nocturnal aspect of the sun, the night lord, Yuval um, uh, looking up, you know, through the earth in a sense, right? So a lot of complicated uh, ideas and suggestions here. Um, these are all important uh, dimensions to its identity. Uh, but I also want to suggest something a little more grounded in history. Uh, that, that's really the heart of my new study. Um, and, and it's about the identity of this face as a historical individual as well. Now, it's important, I think, uh, to realize that identity is part of this, right? Um, the Olin symbol that usually has a little eyeball in its center, has been expanded on the calendar stone into a face, right? And it's kind of interesting in, in Nahuatl, the word ishtli uh, can mean eye, it can also mean face, but it can also be your identity, right? It can be the, the thing that gives one identity. Uh, and, and I'm sure that the artisan is, is playing off of those concepts in putting a face uh, uh, with, with particular features in the center of the Olin movement symbol. Um, now, there are clues beyond just the iconography. And what I want to really focus on here are the hieroglyphs uh, embedded within this circle, right, that, that sometimes get overlooked. Um, right above the uh, pointed top of the Olin, uh, to its left is a hieroglyph, and to its right is a hieroglyph. And I have those drawn here. <clears throat> now, these have been recognized for a long time. 
although there's been some debate about them, but I think there's a general agreement that the hieroglyph on the left is the personal name glyph of Motiogzoma Shokoyotsin or Motiogzoma II, the great emperor of the Aztecs. The hieroglyph to it, the right is a calendrical sign, one flint knife, which is the calendar name associated with the god Huitzilopochtli, who was the patron deity of the Mexica, the patron deity of Tenochtitlan. Um, a great many uh, deities and gods of Aztec mythology have calendrical names uh, that go along with the names that we know well. Why are these here? Why are these names here? Well, uh, it's been suggested, well, Motiogzoma commissioned the monument during his reign. Uh, that's why his name is on it. Okay, well, that makes sense. Uh, one flint is there maybe as a historical reference to the mythical founding, you know, of Tenochtitlan and the migration myths and so forth at the Huitzilopochtli. Eh, that could make sense too. What I would like to suggest is that these are placed in this particular position because they are labels for the image in the center. They're name captions. Uh, this is something that we're familiar with from elsewhere in Mesoamerica and from Aztec sculpture as well. Um, uh, it's a rather simple argument, but one that really I don't think had been emphasized before, which is that this hieroglyph is naming him as Motioxoma and also as one flint, Huitzilopochtli. Here's the name of uh, Motioxoma the second in the Mendoza Codex, a bit simpler, but you see it's a hair, uh, human hair with a, a crown, uh, a pointed uh, diadem uh, that he actually wears here, right? Uh, and a nose plug ornament of turquoise as well. And those are all the elements that we see in his name glyph. Uh, here's another example of his name uh, from the uh, Teokali of Sacred Warfare Monument. And this is one of the very few portraits we have of Motioxoma uh, from an Aztec sculpture, uh, not from the colonial documents. And here he is really interesting, uh, uh, associated directly with uh, the four movement sun disc. And who is on the other side? Huitzilopochtli, right? The, the great uh, patron god recognizable by his hummingbird headdress and also by the one flint glyph uh, that's behind him out of uh, kind of off stage. You can't quite see it on the sculpture. But this is a really interesting, I think, um, uh, parsing of the same elements that we see on the calendar stone. Uh, but uh, on the calendar stone, of course, they're kind of fused uh, within the disc itself. But uh, uh, clearly as an emperor of the of the Mexica, Motioxoma uh, would be, uh, likening himself in terms of ritual performance with with the uh, heroic uh, patron god Huitzilopochtli. Here, uh, the other known portrait of of Motioxoma is um, from Chapultepec Park, from the uh, the uh, stone there, right by the park itself. One can walk right up and see the remains of it uh, at the base of Chapultepec Hill. Uh, now largely destroyed, but this is from Duran again, showing an image of the portrait of the ruler. And here is his hieroglyphic name caption right next to his face. Um, uh, even the presentation of his face kind of frontally right here with the diadem uh, and the, the, the nose the, and lip plug that he has here probably uh, really does echo, I think, what we see here uh, in the calendar stone uh, central image. And let me I'll, I even have a, a photo that will kind of heighten that. Um, a former graduate student of mine, uh, Stephanie Strauss, pointed this out to me uh, during a seminar once at UT, which is that um, the pointed element of the Olean hieroglyph uh, has been playfully uh, incorporated into the portrait as if it is the actual diadem uh, of the of the ruler of the king, um, and uh, so. My proposal uh, is that 
uh, this is very explicitly a historical monument of Huitzilopochtli, uh, representing him and, and labeled as him. Um, and that's really the uh, uh, main feature, I think, of the uh, new interpretation of this. Uh, not that it's an esoteric monument so much, uh, although it certainly is. Um, and I'm going to stop my slides right now because I've gone on long enough, and this is, I think, the, the real point I'm trying to make. Um, the uh, image of the calendar stone is very, very complicated, needless to say. And yes, it does incorporate these cosmological and mythological elements of Tonatiu, the sun, of Tlalteuctli, the earth lord, of Yualteuctli, uh, the, 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 the lord of the night, perhaps. These are not, again, exclusive ideas. But what the Aztec artisans are most explicit about and most concerned with I think in terms of what they're presenting us is showing the historical ruler Motioxoma as the sun, as time, as these cosmological elements. And I don't think it's any accident that it was discovered out in front of his palace, out in front of his house, essentially. That location in the Sokolo, in the plaza, in the Tianquistli, right, uh, I think is encoded in its design. And it is a marker of sorts of the space in front of his palace where people could interact, where people could sit perhaps, where they could make offerings. And it was a place of communal engagement between the emperor and his domestic space and the market out front. Uh, something much more intimate than the Temple Mayor, something much more accessible than the Temple Mayor. In that way, perhaps the calendar stone was a bridge between these different components of Tenochka society. There's so much more to talk about. Uh, many more elements that are in my commentary, in my publication, but I really thank all of you for bearing with me and listening to me now for what was uh, uh, much longer than I had planned. Um, but it's because I, I get so wrapped up in this material that um, I, I probably talk more than I should, but I want to thank all of you. I want to thank Dylan, uh, John Daigle, who helped with some of the technical aspects of all of this. Uh, and I want you all to take a look at the Boundary End website and uh, support what we're trying to do there, creating uh, kind of an oasis of the study of the ancient Americas uh, there in Western North Carolina. So thank you all and thank Boundary End. Well, thank you so much, David, for this wonderful presentation. It's just making me think of so many interesting connection I saw I got through about two-thirds of it <laughs> yeah yeah I'm sure it's just <laughs> anyway it's so much food for thought and just made me think of so many interesting things about related to marking place and time and all mm -hmm. these interesting um, connections that such a rich monument is related to um, so I did want to um, Thank everyone um, for hanging with us. Um, we did have um, a minor uh, technical issue with the communication between the Zoom meeting and um, the YouTube live stream. Oh, okay. Um, so, but we have this, this full recording. Um, and so even though we weren't able to uh, have the, um, the live streaming happen with the chat, um, so folks weren't able to ask questions, um, they will be able to access um, the complete talk uh, very, very soon, um, the okay. next few hours um, by tomorrow. Um, so that will be available through uh, the Boundary and Archaeology Research Center website, boundaryin.com, um, and all of our uh, social media as well. Um, we'll get that posted for you. So um, I'm so sorry for folks that were... Um, hanging in there and waiting for a little while for us to get this resolved, but um, we were able to get a message out to everyone. Um, so hopefully you'll be able to check out our, our website and social media and 
and just stay connected, stay tuned um, on our website and, and social media for the latest updates on um, additional lectures that may be forthcoming, other events. Um, we'll do some in-person events soon, I'm sure. Um, and um, how to access our publications as well um, through the website. So check uh, boundaryin.com um, and look for us on social media as well. Thank you so much again, David. No problem. It's wonderful. Okay. And thank you, Dylan. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye.